This video is about exponential decay functions. I'll well, start by talking about the difference between exponential growth and exponential decay. So exponential growth functions are those that increase more if the function is negative than actually they decrease, but they decrease or increase more and more rapidly as you move across the graph from left to right. And it means that the base of the exponent is a number greater than 1. So if you have a function such as y equals 2 to the x power, I know that that's going to be a growth function because the base, which is 2, is a number that's greater than 1. But this would also be a growth function. If you have a negative coefficient and the base is still a number greater than 1, so for example, negative 3 to the x power, that's also an exponential growth function, even though the trend will be that it's decreasing. It's going to be decreasing more and more rapidly. So on the graph, these functions would look roughly, and this is just a rough sketch, that a positive number like 2 to the x power is going to increase more and more rapidly from left to right. So it starts out increasing slowly and then goes up really quickly from left to right. A negative exponential growth function, it's 3 to the x power, and then each of those values is being made negative. So it's the same shape but flipped over the x-axis. So it starts out decreasing slowly and then decreases very, very quickly. So as you move from left to right, it is either increasing or decreasing more and more rapidly. An exponential decay function is going to decrease or increase more and more slowly from left to right. So it's getting more and more, and more gradual in its change. And this means that the base is a number less than 1, such as a half or three-fourths. So if you have a function like y equals one-half to the x power, it's going to be an exponential decay function. Or if it was negative, something like negative three-fourths to the x power. So it's in these two functions, neither one of these bases is negative here. The base in the first function is one-half. The base in the second function is three-fourths. In the second function, you're just changing all of your y values to negative. So we're just reflecting it. So let's look at what these shapes would look like roughly. We're talking about uh, decreasing more and more slowly as we go from left to right. Um, so it's going to kind of come down from up high and start decreasing really rapidly and then sort of gradually slow down. Okay, so as you move from left to right, it's getting slower and slower in its decrease, though it never stops decreasing. And this one, since it's the same shape just flipped over, the x-axis, as it moves from left to right, starts out by increasing really quickly and then getting more and more gradual. So the difference in exponential growth and exponential decay is whether it's picking up speed, I think about it as speed, whether it's picking up speed or decreasing in speed as you move from left to right. So here's an example of a function. If we went through the whole process of graphing it, we would start by making a table of values using our exponential numbers here, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 as our exponents, plugging those in. We know 1 half to the negative 2 power, just to refresh your memory, means flip it, and the exponent becomes a positive, so it ends up being 4. 1 half to the negative 1 power is 2. 1 half to the 0 power is 1. 1 half to the first power, and 1 half to the second power. So as you can see, our y values are getting closer and closer together as they decrease, so it's going to be decreasing more gradually as we go from left to right. So I'm going to plot these numbers on the, on the graph, negative 2, 4, negative 1, 2, 0, 1, 1, 1 half, 2, 1 fourth, and as you can see, it's getting closer and closer to the x-axis. It's never going to reach it. So we draw the curve, get closer and closer to the x-axis, do not touch it or cross it because there is what we call an asymptote here. And if you're asked to state your domain for this function, x is going to be all real numbers. As you go from left to right, all x values are covered. Whereas the range is going to be only values greater than 0 because we have an asymptote located at y equals 0. Here's an exponential decay function with shifts on it. It has a horizontal translation and a vertical translation. It also has multiplication by 3. So when we make our table this time, we're going to do 1 half to the x power and we're going to do the multiplication by 3 right on our table. I don't like to do these on the table, we're going to do these on the graph. This is a horizontal translation because it's affecting the x value. And it's plus 1, which means we go to the left one unit. We're used to doing the opposite for that. Whereas this is a vertical translation, it's going to affect the y values. 
And you do exactly what it says. It says minus 2. All the points are going to shift down 2. So let's make our table. We're going to use the same values for x. Plug them only into the exponent and then multiply the answer by 3. So 1 half to the negative 2 power is 4. And then we're going to <coughs> multiply it by 3, so it's 12. 1 half to the negative 1 power is 2, times 3 is 6. 1 times 3 is 3. A half times 3 would be 1 and a half. I'll use a decimal. And 1 half to the second power is 1 fourth. So 1 fourth times 3 is 3 fourths. You could write it as a decimal or a fraction, whatever you prefer. And then we graph these numbers on the table. But each of these numbers is going to get shifted when we put it onto our graph. So we're going to take our first point, negative 2, 12, find where it would be on the graph. It's left a little bit off my graph. But then I'm going to shift it to the left one unit. So I'm actually going to negative 3. And down two units, so I'm actually going to be at negative 3, 10. I think this is 10 here. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oops. Down 1. Okay. There's my first point. Take the next point, which is negative 1, 6. Find where that would be on your graph, and then shift it over to the left one and down two units. Find the next point, 0, 3, to the left one and down two units. Find the point 1, comma, 1 and a half. Go to the left one and down two units. And 2, comma, 3 fourths. The left one unit and down two units. And now before I connect these dots to make the curve, it, it helps to draw my asymptote in. Since the asymptote is not at 0 this time, remember that the asymptote is going to move with this, just like in an exponential growth function. If there is a minus 2 as our vertical translation, then our asymptote goes down with that as well. So we'll have an asymptote at y equals negative 2. It is shifting down 2. And so now when I connect my dots, I know that I'm going to be getting closer and closer to that asymptote without ever crossing it. So my domain for this function is again all real numbers, whereas the range is that y is only numbers greater than negative 2, never equal to, because there's an asymptote or barrier located at y equals negative 2. To push this into the realm of word problems, exponential decay models are when things decrease in value by a fixed percent each year, or each month, or each day, or anything that's going to decrease by a fixed percent. So a population where the people are moving out um, at a regular percentage each year, that would be a decay function. Um, or you buy a car, and it decreases in value over the time that you own it. So each year it might be worth less and less by a fixed percent each year. You can model that by the general equation y equals a times 1 minus r to the t power. This 1 minus r is called the decay factor. And the r stands for the percentage at which it's decreasing, but you have to write that as a decimal. t stands for time in years, usually. We've got uh, R is our rate, but we have to write it as a decimal. So remember to write it as a decimal by dividing it by 100. A is always our starting amount here. You may see other letters in this formula as you look it up in different books or on different websites, um, but the pattern needs to be the same. You need to be multiplying your starting amount, whatever letter you're using to represent it, by 1 minus the percentage as a decimal to the time power. And Y in my function, Y stands for the amount at any given time T. So here's an example of how we might use that. A new snowmobile costs $4,200. The value of the snowmobile decreases by 10% each year. We're going to write an exponential decay model for this situation. Remember, in your model, you want it to be a function. So you need to have two variables in it. We're going to have y equals the starting amount, which is 4200, multiplied by 1 minus the percent decrease. But you have to write the percent as a decimal, so 10% is going to be 0.10 to the time power. Leave time as a variable so that you can plug in any time and figure out the value of the snowmobile. So this is written as a function. It's got two variables in it, t and y. If you wanted to simplify it, you can. You'll often see decay models written with the subtraction already done. So you can see that the decay factor is a number less than 1. Right? What I showed you on the first slide, if the base is a number less than 1, 
which here it is because 0.9 is less than 1, then you have a decay function. Then the next part asks us to use the model to determine the value of the snowmobile after five years. We can now plug in 5 as time. And then evaluate this using a calculator. And because it's money, we'll just have to remember that after we multiply it, we're going to round to the nearest hundredth so that it is accurate. And it comes out to... $2,480 and six cents. And if it says specifically in the word problem to round to the nearest whole dollar or something like that, just make sure you're following the directions for your problem. So as you can see, the value decreased from 4200 to 2480 over the course of five years. And this is just a bit of an extension. Can we use the model to predict the year at which the value will be 1000 so I'm going to rewrite our model from that question, which was this, okay, to the team power. And can we use this model to predict the year at which the value is going to be 1,000? So if it's a value of 1,000, that's like our y. So I'm asking, if we knew y, could we figure out t? So we have this equation. And if you attempted to solve this equation for t, you're probably familiar with algebra enough to know you would want to divide by the 4200 first. Divide by this, we're trying to get t by itself and figure out how much time has passed in order for the value to come down to $1,000. So if we take $1,000, divide it by 4200, it's a great first step. We get whatever this is as a decimal, I'll just leave it as um, 5 over 21 for now. So I'm just trying to illustrate a point to you here. If you attempted to solve this equation for t, unless you've learned what a logarithm is, which we will later in this chapter, you actually don't have the tools necessary to solve this equation. Because you can't take a root if you don't know what the exponent is, right? We can't take the t root of this side of the equation. We don't know what t is. We'll still have a variable and we won't be able to isolate it at all. So when you're trying to use a model to solve for the exponent, there's a whole tool that you need to learn still called logarithms for solving an exponential equation like this, where the unknown thing is your exponent. So I just wanted to show you this to set you up for learning about logarithms, which you'll do later in the chapter about exponential functions. And that is all. <laughs>